Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we are again for another session of English 3328, British literature from uh, the late 18th century, beginning of the 19th century to the present time. And we have been discussing Wordsworth, and at the end of our last class, we had been going over Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey in considerable detail. And the one thing that I did want to say by way of concluding our discussion of Tintern Abbey is that if you look at the very last section, and the very last section is the last verse paragraph. These are not stanzas. These are really verse paragraphs. And that is uh, 1, 11, and following. You'll notice what he does is he turns now to his daughter. Excuse me, his daughter. His, uh, I'm thinking about another thing that we're going to be taking up. He's, uh, he turns now to his young sister, Dorothy. And uh, whether she can hear him or not is not clear. But he is addressing her in any event in the poem. And so he talks about how, nor perchance, if I were not thus taught in the way that I have been by nature and by my experiences with nature that we have been talking about, in which he has been profoundly moved and he believes profoundly changed, even to the point where his, his moral character has been changed for the better by his experiences with nature which are essentially spiritual experiences, not simply physical experiences. And as spiritual experiences, they have provoked in him a kind of spiritual growth, both as a poet and simply as a human being. And so he says, nor perchance if I were not thus taught, taught those things in that way. Should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay? For thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river. Thou my dearest friend. Thou my dearest friend. And, you know, at different times in their life they actually lived together. Or when they weren't living together they were living close to one another. And were for much of their lives in very close contact with one another. My dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart. The language of my former heart. The way I was the first time I was here at Tintern Abbey five years ago. I can see that kind of experience now taking place in you. And read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. Of thy wild eyes. Now wild, not in the sense of being out of her mind, but wild in the sense of being out there just enjoying bouncing around and rolling around in the grass and just spontaneously, innocently enjoying nature even as a wild animal could without thinking about it. Oh, yet a little while may I hold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister, and this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Tis her privilege through all the years of our life to lead from joy to joy, for she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts, that neither, that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. So he goes on, by the way, to talk about this in an interesting religious way, that the experience for him is really a kind of religious experience. And this is something that I have touched on with Blake, but this will come up again, of course, with 
Wordsworth and with Coleridge and with some of the other 19th century writers who may not always have been religious in a conventional sense of belonging, say, to a particular religious denomination. But they frequently were profoundly religious in another sense. That is to say, in the search for some kind of spiritual beauty and spiritual enrichment. And this was the sort of thing that they found in their living in nature and experiencing nature. And through that experience with nature were undergoing transformations of themselves, spiritual, intellectual, imaginative, aesthetic, creative transformations in themselves. So uh, you'll frequently note that they will use religious language or religious metaphors to describe their experience. Why not? I mean, what, what other metaphors do we have? Right? I mean, the, the metaphors of religious experience all have to do with the cultivation of the spirit and of some kind of uh, closeness to some higher reality or transcendent reality, right? Uh, from time immemorial, those kinds of metaphors have circulated among us. And so it's natural enough for these poets then to reach out for similar kinds of religious metaphors to explain their spiritual quests and journeys. Okay, so he now is anticipating that his sister Dorothy is going to be experiencing the kind of enrichment after today, after her experience out there at Tintern Abbey today, that he has since he was there the first time. And so he says, even if this were not going to work for me any longer as a profoundly moving experience, still I would be cheered by the knowledge that it is going to do so for you. So, um, very interesting poem, and it becomes a kind of touchstone for us of a certain kind of romantic poetry. And as I've mentioned, this is something that we find not only in people like Wordsworth and Coleridge and other romantic writers, but this is something that we also find not only in England, but we find uh, being speculated about by the idealist philosophers, particularly in Germany. German philosophers from uh, Kant, at least from Immanuel Kant onward. Uh, one thinks, of course, of, of perhaps the greatest German philosopher of the, certainly of the earlier 19th century, perhaps of the whole 19th century, uh, Hegel, who were constantly meditating on and attempting to analyze and to understand what were the subjective conditions for knowledge. People, as I've said here before, had been spending a great deal of time, especially with the emergence of modern science, in, in trying to, to analyze and to articulate the objective conditions for knowledge. But what about the subjective conditions? One of the things that we're going to find in the Romantics is an absorption to the point of a preoccupation for what takes place in the mind of human beings. And by mind, I don't mean simply intellect, but in the mental activities, the mental faculties, the mental energies of human beings as they encounter not only themselves, but the people and the natural world around them. You see, what kinds of interactions or transactions take place? And they're interested in that from the view of the knowing and experiencing subject. Okay? This is not an effort to establish objective norms for judging knowledge as such. Now, it's not, by the way, an effort to try to repudiate the objective norms being established by scientists and philosophers of science 
of the time. It's simply to try another course, something which they felt was far too much neglected. And it's really to a large extent to the romantics then that we owe a modern interest in psychology which focuses on human emotion and on human consciousness. 18th century psychology tended to uh, focus on the faculties for knowing from the point of view of figuring out how we formed ideas of things based on our experience, particularly our observation of empirical data. And that's all well and good. And of course, it's a necessary process in scientific investigation and in the formulation of scientific ideas, ultimately of scientific theories, grand theories. But what was not really being investigated in the process, generally speaking, was what happens in the consciousness of the subject. What kinds of, of, of energy are brought to play in the knowing subject? OK? And this is something we're going to be talking about in greater detail in just a moment as we turn now to Wordsworth's prelude. Some people pronounce it prelude, but uh, you know it may be a little bit uh, clearer for us to call it the prelude because this was intended truly to be a prelude or prelude to a larger, a yet larger work about the poet, poetry, poetic creation, and so forth. Um, Wordsworth began this at the end of the 18th century, as you see on the screen here, with the dates that I've put up here. <coughs> he, if you look at the head note in your text to the prelude, you'll notice that he, he completed several hundred lines in his first effort at it. We know that around 1805, he completed a much longer version of the prelude. He tinkered with this for much of the rest of his life, up at least until 1839. And it was found among his unfinished works after his death, and it was published by his wife and his literary executors with some minor alterations, by the way, in 1850. And if you look at the different versions of the prelude, one of the things you see is not only its subject, the growth of a poet's mind, as described in the poem, but you see something of the growth of Wordsworth's mind over half a century, because he continued to make changes in the work, some of them very minor, but some of them substantive in later years. And one of the things that you notice about Wordsworth is that he progressively became more conservative. As we're about to see in just a moment, he started out as a, uh, as a young radical, a young political radical, very much uh, a celebrator of the French Revolution, which of course from an English point of view, as well as from a conservative French point of view, but certainly from an English point of view, was very, very radical indeed. And there was a handful, but but a handful, of radicals in England at the time who were celebrating the French Revolution as a great new day dawning for humankind. So uh, what we're going to see, of course, is the crisis that Wordsworth went through partly as a result of that kind of political affiliation and the crisis that it brought upon him how he dealt with that crisis, how he came ultimately out of that crisis. But as he tinkered with the poem, and as we compare 
some of his tinkering with the poem in his later years with some of his other writings in his later years, we see that he became much, much more conservative as he grew older. Now, sometimes that uh, is used as oh, support for a kind of cliche that, well, you know, lots of people when they're young become, begin as, uh, as radicals and then they naturally enough become more conservative as they grow older. Well, maybe that's true of some people and not true of others. But nonetheless, it was true of, of Wordsworth. So, uh, not true of Byron, by the way. We'll talk more about that in another class. But in any event, uh, let's go back to the screen, please. This is a poem really of epic proportions. He, he writes this as a new kind of epic. It's not an epic of grand events, such as you find in Homer, Virgil, and Milton. In Homer, we find the great epic narratives of the, the Greeks and the Trojans locked in mortal combat, and of course, the efforts of Odysseus, one of the great Greek heroes, to return after their victory at Troy to return to his homeland and all of the, the trials that he undergoes in doing so. So Homer is painting his picture on a large scale, a grand scale of what is taken to be ancient history. Virgil is doing his redo of the Homeric tradition in which he takes the case of Aeneas, who is one of the Trojan heroes, and he talks about, well, what would have happened to the Trojans after the fall of Troy? Presumably, they weren't all killed in the uh, defeat of Troy and of the Trojans. So what happened, or what could have happened? And so he writes an epic of Aeneas, a great Trojan leader who leads his surviving Trojan followers across North Africa uh, where they encounter all kinds of tests and difficulties and temptations and so forth. And ultimately to Italy where, according to Virgil, Aeneas is going to found the line that ultimately will found Rome leading up to the glorious institution of the Roman Empire, which, by the way, happened in his lifetime. And he was friends with the first emperor, uh, Caesar Augustus, by the way. So once again, you have an epic told on a very grand kind of scale. Well, then there could be nothing grander than the scale of Milton's Paradise Lost, because this is is retelling of the great biblical narrative of the creation and the fall, in which you have the whole cosmos involved. The fight with the rebellious angels in heaven, uh, God through uh, the archangel Michael hurling the devil and uh, all of the minor devils down into hell, which is created especially as a place of punishment for them. Them rising up and sending their great leader, Lucifer, to the Garden of Eden where God has created recently the garden on earth and created man and woman to enjoy the fruits of the garden, save for the fruits of the one tree, of the knowledge of good and of evil. And, of course, we have the temptation in the garden, the fall, and through that, from a Christian theological point of view, and Milton was, by the way, a Christian theologian, uh, one, of, one of the great Protestant or Puritan theologians of his time, and Milton uh, saw this as really the great epic not only of the fall, but of what makes not only possible, but necessary 
the redemption of the whole human family through the coming of Christ. So what could possibly be on a larger epic scale than that? We're talking about the whole history or salvation history, as the uh, Germans like to call it, Heilgeschichte, uh, of the whole human family. So uh, here Wordsworth sees himself as working within a tradition. And you can find all kinds of verbal echoes in Wordsworth of Homer, of Virgil, particularly, certainly, of Milton. Everybody read Milton at this time. You know, it has been uh, uh, estimated by scholars who have studied reading habits of people who were literate in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it is certain that anybody who knew how to read had at least three books on their shelf. One, of course, would be the Bible. Another would be Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which is a religious allegory. And then Milton's Paradise Lost. And uh, so you find all kinds of, of echoes of Milton all over the place in 18th and 19th, and on into 20th century uh, literature, by the way, in English. OK, so. What kind of epic is this then? This is the epic now of the growth of an individual person, of the growth of an individual person. And this too is going to be a kind of journey, but it's going to be a different kind of journey than the journeys of Odysseus and Aeneas, because to a large extent, this is going to be an interior journey. So this is an epic of subjective history. The events in the growth of the poet's mind reconstructed as memory. Subjective history. The events in the growth of the poet's mind reconstructed as memory. Now, we talked about that last time when we looked at Wordsworth's preface to the second edition, the 1800 edition of Lyrical Ballads. And we saw that one of the things that he said took place in the creation of poetry was the recollection in tranquility of an overflow of powerful emotion. Well, what we have here is the representation, in many cases, of overflows of powerful emotion. But here, they are reflected upon after the fact, and they are reconstructed in memory and as memory. So that this is a narrative of Wordsworth's own personal early growth. We're going to see examples of that in just a minute. A severe psychological crisis, virtually a near complete psychological collapse, and healing through discovering the power of spirit, through discovering the power of spirit, of his spirit, or of any human spirit, to commune with nature. So notice what underlies this is a premise not always directly stated though it sometimes is stated in nearly the words that I have up here, that poetry is, or at least can be, therapeutic. Poetry is, or at least can be, therapeutic. Either in composing poetry, or in reading poetry, or both. So this can be a form of therapy for the one who writes poetry. We touched on that last time. 
in which the writing of a poem becomes not only the expression of one's deepest feelings, but also a way of working through, articulating and working through those feelings, especially conflicts in one's feelings, so that the act of poetic expression can itself become a form of psychotherapy. But not everyone is a great poet. Not everyone is a great poet. Now, Shelley said that we're all poets. But, uh, you know, we're not all going to publish poetry, and we may not all uh, compose equally fine poetry, but uh, Shelley claimed that we're all poets in some sense. You see, that the, the same kinds of imaginative processes and possibilities that exist in poets exist in all of us if we would simply cultivate them. If we would simply cultivate them. Well, we can read, and in reading, we can experience. We can enter into the experience. It's not just a matter of experiencing vicariously or secondhand what words were with experiences. We can be drawn into the poem in such a way that we undergo the experience ourselves in a certain sense. Okay? And that that, too, can be a kind of therapy for us as well. Now, it was during this time that people became very interested in Aristotle's notion of how tragedy can arouse in us painful feelings, painful emotions, as we watch the events taking place in the life of a sympathetic character on the stage with whom we can identify sufficiently that we have powerful feelings for that person. And those feelings are painful as we see that person undergoing a tragedy. But then Aristotle says that the whole purpose of this in the design of the play is to lead us to a catharsis or a purging of those emotions. So that when we leave the theater, there should be a sense in which we experience relief and release. OK? At least that's for Aristotle. And uh, for him, that's the whole rationale behind tragedy, at least the very best of tragic plays. Uh, his famous example, of course, is Oedipus or Oedipus the king. Okay. So, then, the prelude is also in the tradition of great autobiographical spiritual journeys, such as St. Augustine's Confessions. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Augustine's Confessions, but... Uh, most people have at least heard about them, right? What happens is that Augustine, after he converted to Christianity, which was in his 30s, by the way, when he did so, after he converted to Christianity, he looked back on his earlier life, and he tried to figure out how it was that he was led to undergo the kind of spiritual and ultimately religious conversion that he did undergo. And so there is a very complex, very subtle psychological analysis of the processes of development that he went through leading up to, and then in the midst of the crisis, which produced his religious conversion. As I said, he wasn't, he wasn't a Christian. His mother was, but he wasn't a Christian until he was, uh, you know, as I said, in his 30s. 
So uh, this becomes the model for the great spiritual autobiographies. Okay? Now, when I say spiritual autobiographies, in Augustine's case, of course, it deals with a literal conversion to Christian religion. There are other spiritual autobiographies which are certainly spiritual in their journey quests, but may not lead to a specifically religious conversion of the kind that Augustine went through. And that's what we're talking about in the case of Wordsworth. Though the ultimate model for such works is Augustine. Wordsworth, however, finds his salvation, and again, you know, we're forced to rely, as he is forced to rely, on religious metaphors here, both in and through nature. And that's something that we're about to get into. What is he talking about now? When he talks about what happens in the growth of a mind in communion with other people, with external events, but ultimately with nature. What happens? And what kind of development does he go through? Okay. Um, well, let's see. Let's look at the very beginning. Okay. Everybody with me? Okay, book first, introduction, childhood and school time. There's a kind of preface at the very beginning. Now remember, this is looking back on events. This is autobiographical. It's not written while the events were taking place. This is looking back on the events being described. This is like Augustine looking back on his earlier life from the perspective of his already having undergone his conversion. Oh, there is blessing. Notice again, see, I'm going to say this over and over again. Uh, the use of, of religious language. What other language do we have to talk about the kinds of things he wants to talk about? Oh, there is blessing in this gentle breeze, a visitant that, while he fans my cheek, doth seem half conscious of the joy he brings from the green fields and from yon azure sky. The breeze? The breeze? Does anybody know uh, what, what breeze could signify? There's, there's actually a kind of pun here. Yeah, do you know? Yeah, you have to use the button there. Isn't the breeze his muse? The breeze is his muse, that's true. The breeze is his muse. Is it his source of inspiration, in a sense. Breeze, wind. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. Like a stick, there's a spirit in nature. Yes. Why, why would you make that connection? Because that's just, that's just how it, how in, it's like a living thing, I guess, going through the, okay. the woods. It's the breeze. You can feel it, I guess. Okay. 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 Uh, in a way, you can feel it. In a way, you can touch the breeze. But in a way, you can't, right? It's like you're putting your hand through it. Uh, and you can't, you can touch it and you can't touch it at the same time. Uh, that, by the way, is, there's, there's a kind of pun that is also involved in that the word in Latin for wind or breath, breeze, I suppose, is also related to the word for spirit, okay? And so it provides the basis, often enough, in Western poetry for talking about 
the wind or the breeze as a kind of metaphor for spirit. Something that we can feel is there, but you can't quite put your finger on it. You can't quite contain it, or you can't quite measure it in the ways that we experience it. Whatever his mission, the soft breeze can come to none more grateful than to me. Escaped from the vast city, vast city of London, where I long have pined, where long have pined, a discontented sojourner, somebody who is forced to live in the city, but that's not where I wanted to live. Now free, free as a bird to settle where I will. What dwelling shall receive me, and what vale shall be my harbor? Underneath what grove shall I take up my home? And what clear stream shall with its murmur lull me into rest? The earth is all before me. With a heart joyous, nor scared at its own liberty, I look about. And should the chosen guide be nothing better than a wandering cloud, I cannot miss my way. I breathe again. It's as if I've been suffocating. And now I breathe again. Do you ever go out into the country and you feel like you can actually breathe? in a way that you don't feel like you can breathe in the city? Um, OK. Trances of thought and mountings of the heart come fast upon me. It is shaken off that burden of my own unnatural self, of my own unnatural self, the heavy weight of so many a weary day, not mine. In other words, we live lives, most of us, much of the time, maybe not all the time, but much of the time at any rate, which are burdensome. I mean, there are all kinds of stuff we got to do, right? About which we can't make choices. But now he has gotten out of that kind of unnatural state, once again into the mountains, the lakes, the free breeze, and he's free again. And such as were not made for me. So notice, down a little bit further, in uh, 31, Dear liberty, yet what would it avail but for a gift that consecrates the joy? Consecrate also is a term taken over from religion, from religious services. For I, methought, while the sweet breath of heaven was blowing on my body, felt within a correspondent breeze that gently moved with quickening virtue. Now notice what he's saying here. Not only am I feeling this breeze which is coming to me from heaven, as it were, but I feel within me a correspondent, a co respondent breeze co together right co together respondent responding breeze in other words it's not just something outside me which is coming upon me or into me there's something in me that is stirring as well okay and it is the intermingling of these two stirrings from outside and from inside that is what is really real, and that's what he wants to talk about. And that's what this whole poem is going to be an effort to try to discover and to articulate. OK, uh, and notice that this is breaking up a long-continued frost, line 40. And then in 46, he directly addresses his friend. And the friend, of course, is his very dear friend, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And remember that when he first wrote this was when the two of them had first become very, very good friends. And they were actually meeting together almost daily 
taking walks together, talking about poetry, writing poems, reading their poems to one another, uh, going over one another's poetry, and so on and so on and so on. And of course, they published, as you know now, Leaves of Grass in 1798 at around the same time that Wordsworth was working on the first version of the prelude. So, here he's addressing Coleridge. Thus far, O oh friend, did I, not used to make a present joy the matter of a song, pour forth that day my soul in measured strains that would not be forgotten and are here recorded. To the open fields I told a prophecy. A prophecy. See, this is also the poet as prophet in the same sense that the great epic poets of the past had been prophets not unlike the biblical prophets. Poetic numbers came spontaneously to clothe, notice, in priestly robe, a renovated spirit, capital S spirit, singled out such hope was mine for holy services. Okay? See how he views himself as engaged in a priestly function as a poet now. My own voice cheered me and far more the mind's internal echo, internal echo of the imperfect sound. To both I listen, drawing from them both a cheerful confidence in things to come. Well, okay, where is this leading? Well, still in book one, flip over to line 357. And following. Here we have one of the most famous scenes in Wordsworth's Prelude. He's a young boy, and he gets a rowboat, and he rows out on a lake. And he talks about the experience that he has, and he can't really explain that experience in common sense terms. Okay? You know what I mean? Sometimes we have an experience, and we go over it, and we try to explain the experience, and we try to use our common sense. Okay? But this is an experience that, at least for him, cannot be explained in such terms. So what does that lead to? One summer evening, led by her, nature, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cave, its usual home. Straight I unloosed her chain and stepped in, pushed from the shore. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure, because he's actually taking the boat without permission. It's somebody else's boat. Nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they met, melted all into one track. What he's talking about here is the play of the boat and then, of course, the oars on the surface of the water. Okay? As the... the water is illuminated by the moon. Of, well, one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a chosen point, with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge. Okay? I don't know if you've ever rowed but uh, in this kind of rowing, you're rowing backwards. I mean, it's not like rowing in a canoe where you're going forward. This is in a rowboat in which you're, you're actually with your back towards your destination. Okay, so how do you row in a straight line? It's actually not very easy. I don't know if you've done this or not, but it's not very easy to row in a straight line. Uh, you can very easily start rowing in circles. Uh, but in any event, uh, one of the ways that you're supposed to do this is by fixing on some point and keeping the boat aligned uh, in relation to that fixed point. Okay? 
Um, but now, like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a certain point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary. For above was nothing but the stars and the gray sky. She was an elfin pinnace. Lustily, I dipped my oars into the silent lake. And as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When from behind that craggy steep, this is the mountain he's got his eyes fixed on, till then the horizons bound, a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. See what happens? He's got his eyes fixed on this ridge on the mountain, uh, uh, this ridge on the mountainside, on the other side of the lake as he's rowing. And now as he's going along and he's really beginning to pick up speed, it is as if there is some huge peak rearing up over him. I struck and struck again. This has struck the water with his oars. And growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars. And still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own and measured motion, like a living thing strode after me. Notice, he's having the impression of this huge mountain striding across the water toward him. With trembling oars I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle for many days, my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. O'er my thoughts there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remain, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colors of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through the mind by day, and were a trouble to my dreams. See, he's undergone some kind of an experience out there. Now, don't forget that in part it's a guilty experience because he wasn't supposed to take this boat. I mean, it's not exactly stealing the boat, but he's, quote, borrowed the boat. But, you know, what if the owner of the boat came along? Uh, you know, no doubt the owner of the boat would not have been happy at all about this. So, uh, and, and he's had this tremendous kind of, of experience in which nature seems to be alive stalking him, looming over him. Wisdom and spirit of the universe, thou soul, he's addressing some kind of spiritus mundi, some kind of spirit of the world or even of the universe. Thou soul, that art the eternity of thought, that givest to forms and images a breath and everlasting motion. Notice once again the metaphor of breath. Not in vain by star or starlight, thus from my first dawn of childhood didst thou intertwine for me the passions that build up our human soul, not with the mean and vulgar works of man, but with high objects, with enduring things, with life and nature, purifying thus the elements of feeling and of thought, and sanctifying, again, a religious metaphor, by such discipline, both pain and fear, until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart. Wow. Now, it's not that he understood all that then, when he was a child. It's only looking back on that that he understands what was beginning to happen to him. And that's exactly what Augustine does in his Confessions, by the way. 
when he looks back from the perspective of being a mature man, having undergone his religious conversion, and he looks back on his childhood, he looks back on his teen years, he looks back on his early adulthood, and he now understands from his new perspective, he now understands what was going on inside him in a way that he did not understand before. Now, of course, because Augustine is not only converted to Christianity, but he becomes one of the greatest Christian theologians of all time, he interprets that in theological terms as the spirit of God working in him. But notice, all you have to do is change a few words around, and you've got something very close to Wordsworth, don't you? Wordsworth's not talking about this as a Christian theologian, but he is talking about some kind of, of great universal soul or spirit which is working in him even in ways that he did not comprehend as a child. Okay, so let's move right along here. And let's move to the end of book one. And here he refers once again to his friend, of course, Coleridge. And he read, or at least read, sections of different uh, drafts or versions of this poem to Coleridge. I began my story, this is at the, in the last first paragraph, beginning in line uh, 613 and following. I began my story early, not misled, I trust, by an infirmity of love for days disowned by memory, fancying flowers where none, not even the sweetest, do or can survive. For him at least, whose dawning day they cheered, nor will it seem to thee, O friend, Coleridge, so prompt in sympathy, you who are so prompt in sympathy, fellow feeling, the old sense of, of sympathy, is not feeling sorry for somebody, but having fellow feeling with another person. Remember in uh, your science class, probably in eighth grade or ninth grade or sometime like that, when you would have the little experiment with tuning forks? Tuning forks, and you'd, you'd strike one fork and it would vibrate, and then the other one would start vibrating as well. And that was described to you as sympathy, right? Well, that's actually a metaphor for the physical event taken from the older sense of the word sympathy, which now we've more or less replaced by the word empathy, to feel with another person. And that's what he gets from Coleridge, you see, is that Coleridge can actually feel with him some of these same things. O oh, friend, so prompt in sympathy that I have lengthened out with fond and feeble tongue, the old sense of fond, which uh, in Shakespeare, for example, means something like foolish, a tedious tale. Meanwhile, my hope has been that I might fetch invigorating thoughts from former years, might fix the wavering balance of my mind. Go back to former years and fix the wavering balance of my mind. Now, he hasn't told us about this yet, but he's anticipating the kind of emotional crisis that he's going to go through, okay, in which he lost the balance of his mind. And then notice farther along there in 637 and following, one end and in the sense of goal, at least hath been attained. My mind hath been revived. My mind hath been revived. Okay? And that, of course, is what the whole work is going ultimately to be about. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the early books here so that we can focus on certain passages that illustrate the development that he's talking about here. Um, he talks about having gone off to school, then he talks about having gone off to Cambridge University where he went to college, and uh, that was not a terribly meaningful experience for him. Uh, many scholars, as I mentioned last time, and historians have uh, talked about how Cambridge was not in its best days at that time, and the curriculum was not particularly uh, exciting to somebody of Wordsworth's original personality. Um, okay, so, book the sixth. Book the sixth. The part of book the sixth that we're going to look at involves his response to his trip through France and Switzerland. People used to do this a lot. Some people still do, I suppose. You know, uh, students, either on vacation or maybe when they graduated from college, they would uh, go off. I'm talking about, you know, having some money to do this, so you don't really have to have that much. Uh, and going off to Europe and simply tramping around, you know, and, and experiencing the sights, the culture, and so forth of continental Europe. So, uh, and of course, you know, as I said, uh, that's something which is by no means over. You know, one of my daughters did that when she went uh, to, to Spain uh, on one of those study abroad programs and then ended up after it with a friend of hers whom she had met in Spain from, but who was originally from Australia. And the two girls went, you know, all the way around Europe together just riding the rails, you know, and staying in hostels, which cost almost nothing. And, uh, you know, just had a great experience. Well, that's the kind of thing, of course, that Wordsworth and a friend of his are doing here. But the France they arrive at is France at a very special moment in its history. This is France having just gone through the French Revolution. When the third summer freed us from restraint, a youthful friend, he too, a mountaineer, somebody who loved the mountains and loved to hike in the mountains, not slow to share my wishes, took his staff and sallying forth, we journeyed side by side, bound to the distant Alps. A hearty slight did this unprecedented course imply of college studies in their set rewards, nor had in truth the scheme been formed by me without uneasy forethought of the pain, the censures, and ill omening of those to whom my worldly interests were dear. In other words, a lot of people tried to talk him out of doing this. But nature then was sovereign in my mind. Nature then was sovereign in my mind. And mighty forms, forms in nature, these are almost platonic forms in nature, seizing a youthful fantasy, excuse me, a youthful fancy, had given a charter to irregular hopes in any age of uneventful calm among the nations. Surely would my heart have been possessed by similar desire. But Europe at that time was thrilled with joy. France standing on the top of golden hours and human nature seeming born again. Now it's hard for people to imagine this. The American Revolution had taken place just a few years earlier. But the American Revolution was a relatively small event. I mean, ultimately, in the course of history, a huge event. But at the time, a very important event, but, but small by comparison with the French Revolution, because here was one of the most ancient kingdoms in Europe overthrown by the people. OK? I mean, it, it's, it's just 
very, very difficult to imagine how people felt at that point. Uh, both those who were being attacked and those who were the liberators or presented themselves as liberators, okay, with an incredible sense of being at a moment of history that was irreversible and that the world would never be the same again and that principles like liberty, equality, fraternity would prevail. In other words, democracy, Republican democracy would prevail. Okay, uh, and in the long run, that happened. Now, of course, France had various other things happen along the way, and we're going to hear about some of those in just a moment. Uh, unfortunately, under Robespierre and others, there was the reign of terror with Madame Guillotine, you know, in which hundreds of people were executed because they were political opponents of uh, Robespierre and the, the Committee of Public Safety, Public Security, and uh, as it was called. And it was a bloodbath, you know, and had little to do with what we normally think of as a democratic republic and the protection of the rights of human beings. And of course, that paved the way for a military dictator to arise in the middle of that kind of chaos. And of course, the military dictator was Napoleon. And Napoleon eventually had himself crowned the emperor of France. Well, actually, he didn't have himself crowned. He took the crown away from the pope. He had the pope summoned from Rome, by the way, to, uh, to crown him. And he took the crown away from the pope and put it on his own head uh, to signify that only Napoleon could crown Napoleon. Not even the pope could crown Napoleon. Well, okay. Uh, and of course, eventually, you know, he was defeated and then defeated again. And we have various stages at which there are restorations of the monarchy and then the monarchy is kicked out again, and then the monarchy returns, and then the monarchy is kicked out again, and so forth, uh, until we have a series of monarchies and a series of republics in the 19th and then ultimately in the 20th centuries. So, uh, so in the long run of history, things did change. But they didn't change all at once, and at first they changed, it appeared, for the worse. So, okay, let's see what happens now with Wordsworth, full of his enthusiasm. Um, he, he goes on, let's see, in Book the Ninth. Go over to the beginning of, of the selection from the ninth book. This is about his residence in France. And remember, while this does not become part of his account, uh, he had a love affair with Annette Villon. They had a child when he had to leave France. And they were going to get married. When, they had to, when he had to leave France, uh, you know, he had every intention of going back to England and then returning to France and marrying Annette Villon. He was prevented from doing so in large part because England and France declared war on one another and, and were then at war with one another. And so it was impossible for somebody to get from England to, uh, to France. And uh, so then when they finally could have gotten together and married, they both decided that they had changed so much that they no longer really had anything in common to get married for. Uh, but they did have a child, and it is to his credit that he acknowledged the child, and uh, he took care of the child, and took care of support of the child. So, okay, so here we have, in his residence in France from the ninth book, 
lines uh, oh, 17 and following. Now we start afresh with courage and new hope, risen on our toil. Fair greetings to this shapeless eagerness. Whene'er it comes, needful in work so long, thrice needful to the argument which now awaits us. Oh, how much unlike the past. So he's, he's not only talking about historical events, but he's also talking about the progress of his own poem and how things are about to take a new turn. Over in 42 and following, he refers to Paris. He refers in uh, 49 to the National Synod, which was actually the National Assembly, and the Jacobins, who were the revolutionaries. Uh, and in line 50, I saw the revolutionary power. And uh, he refers even in line 60, Eight to the Bastille. And you'll remember that on June 14th, 1789, that uh, this was the date of the storming of the Bastille. And that was the beginning, officially at any rate, of the, uh, of the French Revolution. And that's the date that you know, everybody in history class has to, has to memorize. And of course, it's commemorated to this day in France as Bastille Day, with great, great applause and ceremony and jollity and so forth. I made the mistake one time of driving into Paris with a, uh, a friend of mine who then was a professor at the uh, University of Florida. and. Uh, forgot that this was going to be Bastille Day when we arrived in a rented car in Paris. And of course, talk about gridlock. There's nothing on the Katy Freeway to, uh, to parallel what we experienced there, trying to drive into Paris on Bastille Day. And there were young people literally walking across the hoods of cars. And some of them had bottles of wine in both hands, and they'd come over and offer you drinks and so forth, and wanted to sing and dance and all the rest of it. And you know, uh, it was just a big party. <laughs> so, uh, and still is on Bastille Day. Okay, at the end of Book Ninth, or our selection at any rate, notice that he had become a patriot, and my heart was all given to the people with a capital P, and my love was theirs. OK, then in the 10th book, we're going to have his return to England. He refers in line 51 to the prison where the unhappy monarch lay associate with his children and his wife in bondage. And of course, they're going to be executed in fairly short order. And then he refers in lines uh, 222, I believe that is, and following, how he is dragged by a chain of harsh necessity, so seemed it, then anyway. Now I thankfully acknowledge force by the gracious providence of heaven to England I return. And then skip down to the next verse paragraph, lines 263 and following. What then were my emotions when in arms Britain put forth her freeborn strength in league, O oh, pity and shame with those confederate powers? What he's saying is, what then were my emotions when Britain declared war to join allies in war against France? And what he found was, not in my single self alone I found, but in the minds of all ingenuous youth, change and subversion from that hour. No shock given to my moral nature had I known down to that moment. See, I'd never experienced anything like that before. See, on the one hand, he wants to be a loyal Englishman, but on the other hand, he feels now this terrible loyalty to France. And so he feels utterly divided. And so 
in 284 and following, yea, afterwards truth most painful to record, exalted in the triumph of my soul, when Englishmen by thousands were o'erthrown. Secretly, I welcomed the French victories. In 290, this is a conflict of sensations in me, by the way, without name of which he only may love the sight of a village steeple, as I do can judge when in the congregation, bending all to their great father, prayers were offered up or praises for our country's victories. And mid the simple worshipers, perchance, I only, like an uninvited guest, whom no one owned, sat silent, shall I add, fed on the day of vengeance yet to come. Here he is in church. And what are the people doing in church? In an English church. They're praying for the soldiers, the English soldiers, right? And he feels that he can't join in the prayer. He feels alienated from his own people and from his own fellow parishioners in the church. Well, let's take this up again after the break.